Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our forum this afternoon. As I look outside my window, it is overcast. I hope the weather is also good where you are uh, in the rest of Singapore, perhaps other parts in the world as well, who knows. Uh, I'm Tan Tan Hao, an adjunct senior research fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, um, part of the National University of Singapore. And today I am your moderator for the forum. So this is the second IPS online post general election 2020 uh, forum. So this is uh, second in a series of three. And uh, it is in this forum that we look at the very important topic of internet and media use in the election, in this election. Um, as you really know, this session is uh, being beamed on Facebook live and it will also be recorded and put up on our IPS website as well as an, on Facebook later. Um, we are very interested in your questions and your views as well. So please take the opportunity to uh, write in uh, in the comments and questions section of Facebook and then we will try our utmost to uh, answer as many as we can of your questions and also maybe uh, read some of the comments that, uh, that you make. Um, at the end of this um, forum, we are also very interested in hearing your feedback, uh, where we have uh, done well and where we have not done well and your views about it. So we will put a link up in the uh, comment section uh, of Facebook as well. So to get to our forum, uh, this is a, this was uh, an interesting election from the media point of view for a number of reasons. The most obvious of which is uh, we're in the midst of a uh, pandemic and uh, in a way we were the internet, sorry, the election, uh, in particular the hustings uh, were forced to go online. So uh, it really overturned, you know, the whole media arrangement, at least. Um, then secondly, it's exciting because of the memes uh, that uh, appeared and, uh, uh, and the viral material, right? So on the opposition side, we have James, Mr. James Lim uh, making his impact uh, in various videos, uh, in particular the debate with uh, our Mr. Vivian Balakrishnan. Uh, we have uh, the hype beast uncle or uncle hype beast, um, Mr. Tan Ching Bok, uh, who made a splash with young voters uh, using a technology which he, he uh, I think, largely just learned. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the issue of uh, Ms. Raish Khan, which uh, attracted a lot of, uh, of uh, debate. And uh, on the government side, we have the poor uh, Mr. Ivan Lip, um, uh, phenomenon which uh, would, might not have, would not have happened without the internet. And of course, uh, uh, the East Coast plan, uh, which became a meme. And of course, hovering over this, the whole issue of, of Ma. Um, so that is from sort of like the uh, layman's point of view, right? But today we are interested in uh, the expert's point of view, right? So what are the Underly underlying factors and me mechanisms, right, which are working uh, behind the scenes as far as the use of uh, the internet and uh, traditional media, uh, social media platforms. Uh, what are the underlying factors and mechanisms which um, are at play and what role do they play in how the different generations uh, look at uh, um, uh, the information put out, uh, how they vote, uh, how the swing voters uh, um, are also not by, by internet media and how the parties use the media and to what effect. So these are expert views. And of course, we have four experts uh, with us. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Carol Soon, Head of Society and Culture Department and Senior Research Fellow at uh, the Institute of Policy Studies, where I am. And Dr. Natalie Pang, 
uh, senior lecturer in the Department of Communications and New Media in NUS, and from the same department, Associate Professor uh, Chang Wei Yu. And uh, we have also Mr. Chua Chin Hon, Chief Data Analyst at the Analytics Labs. So there are four very, very exciting uh, presentations. Um, and they will talk about uh, four topics in that order. Was there a digital and generational divide uh, between uh, the voters as far as media use is concerned? Right? So we are in this forum interested in media use. How has political online engagement changed from the last election to this? And who were the swing voters and what influenced them? And how political parties use social media and how effectively or not, right? Um, this is the third of a similar series which began in 2011 uh, where uh, I was uh, involved in a survey and like in 2011 and 2015, uh, this year is also based on a survey and more details of that will come from, uh, from in particular, uh, Dr. Carol soon. Um, and I um, also would like to add that it's uh, a pleasure for me because uh, Natalie, Wei Yu, Carol were also at the 2011 and 2015 presented their findings as well. So uh, there's a nice continuity. And of course, uh, Chin Hon uh, has been a journalist, a uh, respected journalist for a long time. And uh, we welcome him to this uh, little circle, right? So without further ado, I will start off uh, by handing the mic over to uh, Dr. Soon, who will look at the platforms and how it affected voting behavior and whether there was a generational and age divide, right? Uh, as far as media use is concerned. So, uh, Carol, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tan Hao. Um, can we have the first slide, please? Okay, um, it's our pleasure, really, to have Tan Hao moderate this uh, panel. Um, he was the first person I thought of and the first to ask. Um, so since 2011, like what Tan Hao mentioned, IPS has surveyed how people use the media and the internet during the general election. So this survey on general election 2020 is the third in the series. Now, the first three presentations that you will hear on this panel are based on the IPS survey. Um, but before I start, I would like to take this opportunity to thank research assistants Neil Yi Win and Wu Yue Tin for their indispensable contribution to the study. Next slide, please. Now, leading up to polling day on 10th July, there were many burning questions, one of which was, will GE 2020 be the internet election? So the increased visibility of youth's interest in political and social issues also led to the question if youth voters wanted different things from older voters. And with the shift of election campaigning to the online space, there was a lot of speculation on whether there would be higher engagement among the youths and if the older generation who may not be as digitally savvy and connected be excluded. Next slide. So today, my presentation will focus on these four questions. I will focus on how the internet and media was used during GE 2020 and if there have been any developments since GE 2015. And with the migration of political campaigning online, thanks to COVID-19, how did people engage with political parties and candidates? More importantly, um, were there differences in internet and media use among different generations? And what else mattered to the voting outcomes? Next slide. So before I go into the details, here are the top line findings. Um, we found that traditional forms of mass media such as TV, print and radio fell in importance in terms of um, people's usage. Their digital counterparts and social media increased in importance. So we added a new question for this survey. We asked voters how they engage with parties and candidates online. And we found that social networking sites and IM were most used by voters compared to other platforms. And while older voters use traditional forms of mass media more frequently than younger ones, digital platforms were popular across all age groups. And I am, as you would see, played a very important role during this election, especially for the boomers. Next slide. 
So fifth, we've, we also asked people, in our survey, we asked people whom they voted for. And with this data, we could analyze what influenced how people voted. And we found that people's voting behavior was influenced by their internet use, but other factors also mattered. Now, the strongest predictor for how people voted was their primary reason for voting. So people who voted for the PAP and those who voted for the opposition cared about different things. People who voted for the PAP and those who voted for the opposition also use media differently. Next slide. Just a few notes on the methodology. An online survey was administered by YouGov after polling day with more than 2,000 eligible voters. As per the previous two surveys on internet and media use, we ask respondents questions on their demographics, media use, political traits, and voting behavior. And since we wanted to find out if there were generational differences in media use and voting behavior, we grouped our respondents into four categories, first-time voters, other youths, sandwich generation, and boomers. Next slide. Now, before we take a closer look at people's media use and the factors that influence how they voted, let us take a look at how people voted. Now, about 47% of the respondents refused to answer this question, but that still left us with slightly more than half with, who answered the question. So that's more than 1,000 respondents. Now, excluding those who did not answer the question, 63.8% said they voted for the PAP and 32% said they voted for the opposition, percentages that, well, are quite close to the outcome of the generation. Now, so how did different generations um, vote? Next slide. If we take a look at this chart, we see a greater proportion of voters from each group voting for the PAP. The proportion of people who voted for the PAP increased with the age bands, and a larger proportion of young voters voted for the opposition. Next slide. Now let us take a close look at voters' media use. We group the platforms into two categories, mainstream media and social media. So essentially, mainstream media are characterized by a source to audience communication model. On the other hand, social media are largely driven by peer-to-peer -peer sharing and production of content. So we looked at four types of social media in our study with social networking sites encompassing Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next slide. So here is the ranking of the media that were used by voters to seek information on the election in 2020. And the list is presented in descending order of usage. Now, online websites of Singapore mass media were used the most, with more than 45% of the respondents saying they used them about once a day or several times a day. TV followed closely, and Singapore online-only news and information websites occupy the third place. Social networking sites and IM platforms are ranked fourth and fifth, fifth respectively, and the traditional forms of the mass media saw much lower usage this year. Print newspapers and radio are at seventh and ninth place. Now, clearly, digital news platforms and social media played a more important role in people's information diet during this election compared to the traditional forms of media. So how were voters' media usage for GE 2020 different from that of 2015? Next slide. So in this slide, we compare the usage of media for both elections using mean scores. Now, while TV was still among the top three media used for information seeking, it fell to second place in 2020. Singapore mass media on digital platforms rose to take the top place in 2020. Now, in 2015, if you recall, blogs were still relatively visible, but the online space has changed in the past five years. Blogs managed by individuals and small groups have given way to online-only news and information sites, which have a business and editorial model that seeks to draw eyeballs. Now, these sites were third most used by voters during GE 2020. So if we compare the two elections, we see a sharp drop in popularity for print newspapers and radio. And while social networking sites and IM platforms did not see any changes in terms of ranking, they were used slightly more during the recent election. Next slide. Now let us take a close look at the top three media platforms used by each generation. Now, as you can see from this table, digital sources played a very important part in younger voters' information diet, with social networking sites being their top choice. Now this echoes research that has been done in other countries, indicating that if news is not on social, it is unlikely to be seen by young people. 
Now, TV and mainstream news delivered through online websites of Singapore mass media formed a staple for older voters, and TV was particularly important for the boomers. Now, what is interesting here is the importance of IM as a source of news for boomers. We ran a comparison with the 2015 data and found that this group's use of media changed the most. While TV was still the most frequently used media for this group, Digital platforms such as online websites of Singapore mass media and IM have become more important for boomers in 2020. Next slide. So in summary, our analysis showed significant differences in internet and media usage among the four generations. Our study shines the spotlight on IM as an equalizing platform. So IM was the leveler as different generations used it as an information seeking tool to a similar extent. Boomers use IM as much as other generations. Next slide. So with the move of political campaigning to the online space, we added a new question this year to find out how voters engage with parties and candidates. And our survey found that social networking sites and IM were the top two most frequently used platforms by voters to learn about and interact with parties and candidates. About one third of the respondents use these two platforms once a day or more. The more traditional forms of party communication, such as brochures and newsletters, were used by less than 10% of the voters once a day or more. Next slide. Again, we observe distinctively different patterns among generations. Just as youths rely more on social networking sites to seek information on the election, they also use social networking sites more frequently than older voters to learn about and interact with parties and candidates. And here, IM throws up another surprise. Our study found that boomers use IM more frequently than all the other generations to learn about and interact with parties and candidates. So together with the earlier finding on boomers IM use for information seeking, we see how this platform has become an important part of election communication. In addition to being a generation neutral medium, in terms of people's access to information, IM is helping to close the digital divide between generations of political engagement. Next slide. Now to examine what else mattered in shaping people's voting behavior, we asked people for the primary reasons behind their votes and their satisfaction with different issues. So we presented survey respondents with a list of 11 options and they were asked to pick one, only one primary reason behind their vote. So this slide shows that the top primary reasons behind people's votes were quality of the candidates followed closely by having alternative views in parliament and parties track record. Next slide. When we take a closer look at what mattered to different generations, we see on this table that all age groups were motivated by the same three primary reasons. However, the group that stood out was the boomers, among whom the largest proportion was driven by the primary reason of having alternative views in parliament. Now, this could be due to them having seen how the parliament has progressed and evolved in the past decades and having more interest in hearing from more diverse views. Next slide. As for people's satisfaction with how the government is handling different issues, voters were most satisfied with how the government managed issues relating to education, transportation, and healthcare. However, they were least satisfied with how the government handled issues relating to population growth and cost of living. Next slide. When we compared voter satisfaction by generation, we found significant differences for eight out of 11 issues. So boomers who have gone through decades of nation building were most satisfied with how the government handled issues relating to transportation, housing and education. They were also more satisfied with government's management of work-life harmony and environmental issues. Youths were most satisfied with how the government managed population growth, healthcare and COVID-19. But in general, the sandwich generation was the least satisfied group. Next slide. So far, we have shown that there are significant differences among generations in terms of their media usage their primary reasons for voting and their satisfaction with how the government managed different issues. So what mattered more to how people voted? So what we did was we conducted a regression analysis using two outcome variables, whether people voted for the PAP or for the opposition, and this is what we found. So the table you see here shows only the significant predictors, and the bigger the numerical values, the stronger the predictors for people's voting decision. 
So in the next slide, I'm going to summarize the key findings in text. Next slide, please. So people's primary reasons for voting were the strongest predictor for how they voted. So for instance, change mattered more to people who voted for the opposition. Now these voters wanted alternative views in parliament and disliked one party for reasons beyond those listed in the questionnaire. On the other hand, consistency was valued by people who voted for the PAP. This group always voted for the same party and valued party's track record. Now media played an important role in influencing how people voted but to a lesser extent. However, it's interesting to note that the media platforms that predicted how people voted are all digital or internet based. Next slide. Now this slide and the next slide, next slide please, uh, the recap of the findings that I had presented to you right at the beginning, after which I have brought you through the details. And now next slide, we come to the conclusion. So did GE 2020 live up to people's expectations of it as an internet election? To be honest, an internet election could mean several things. Just because campaigning went online doesn't mean that the internet play an important role. So my, pres my presentation showed how the internet, how GE 2020 was an internet election. It was an internet election given the role of digital and social in information dissemination, political engagement, and their influence on voting behavior. Next, there were fears, if you recall, of a digital divide between young and old voters. So while our survey showed that some divisions persisted, older voters, particularly the boomers, are catching up with their use of digital platforms and social media, particularly I am. However, we are, while we are seeing equalization of access, we need to scrutinize that nature of engagement. So findings from another question in our survey, which I have, did not have time to present, found more nuanced generational differences in IM use. We found that compared to younger voters, older voters were less likely to have received content such as memes, music clips, and posters associated with the election via IM. They were also less likely to belong to IM groups that discuss election issues, parties, and candidates. So when we compare these findings with the earlier finding on boomers using IM the most to learn about parties and candidates, our study suggests that boomers may be using IM in a more passive manner and using content that in traditional formats. So taken together, our findings indicate that more needs to be done to help older voters harness the interactivity of social media. And my last point, I think this survey provides an inkling of what's to come for future elections. Perhaps the question now to ask is, will the next genera general election be an IM election? So instant messaging is a boon, given how it is leveling people's access to election information, parties and candidates. However, it may also be a bane. Currently, when used in an election context, at least in Singapore, IM operates mainly in the broadcast model, which poses challenges to two-way communication and genuine engagement with citizens. Also, as the dark web of social media, issues such as protecting information integrity will need to be addressed. And um, next slide. And with that, I thank you for listening to me. Um, happy to take your questions at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. As, uh, I should have warned you that, you know, all four presentations are extremely rich, rich in data, rich in, uh, you know, the ideas. Uh, so, um, yeah, be prepared for another 45 minutes of very exciting, uh, intense discussion, of which uh, Carol's the first example. And, you know, uh, as a boomer myself, uh, the fact that uh, I am uh, like uh, um, WhatsApp is very much part of my media uh, consumption and participation uh, 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 with other boomers as well as younger people and uh, some older people. Uh, uh, I will say that, you know, it, it really, uh, the, the, inf the data really uh, sort of supports the live experience, at least for me. Um, I don't know whether the, the digital divide is really uh, amongst, uh, between generations, but between the, uh, the rich and the poor. Uh, and uh, I wonder whether you have uh, done uh, any analysis on that, and if you could, maybe you could look at that. But before that, we'll pass you on to, uh, I'll pass you on to Dr. Natalie Pang, uh, who will talk about uh, using the internet uh, uh, as a tool for political engagement and engagements of different kinds, 
uh, and uh, and how uh, and whether trust in different kinds of uh, media uh, uh, also influence the way uh, people uh, use uh, different kinds of uh, media. And uh, with that, I'll pass you on to Natalie. Thank you, Tan Hao. Um, it's uh, great to be on a panel of friends. Um, and I would like to start off by thanking uh, IPS for including me and supporting my research on the internet and general elections uh, since 2011. Um, and uh, uh, I would also like to thank our research assistant, uh, Wu Yue Ting, for really helping me uh, so much, especially the past few days to prepare this presentation. Now, my key area of uh, interest is digital citizenship. So this means that I um, study how people use uh, internet uh, for various personal, social, civic, or political uh, purposes. Uh, during the 2020 election, uh, we may have observed about how there seems to be so much more content as Dan Hao rightfully uh, you know, uh, talked about, uh, not just created and also shared, uh, more opinions uh, that are expressed using various platforms and so on. So my key question uh, going into uh, this uh, study and uh, presentation is really how online engagement during this election has changed uh, from 2015. Uh, next slide. So very quickly, there are three key findings which I will elaborate in the coming slides. There are different forms of uh, online engagement, in particular, um, uh, expressive and informational engagement has increased significantly in 2020. Uh, overall, we also observe that trust in uh, mass media has increased, but uh, decreased trust in mass media is significant in predicting expressive engagement, especially for younger voters. Uh, declines in political knowledge is also uh, interestingly um, uh, predicting ex increase in uh, expressive engagement in 2020. And uh, this really, in my opinion, has implications in terms of how we should um, develop citizenry in the coming years in Singapore. Next slide, please. There is a number of ways we can uh, measure social media engagement. Um, since the 2015 general election, uh, post general election survey, we have measured them in three ways. The first is expressive, which refers to really how uh, people use social media to express opinions in various manners, uh, such as writing a post on a blog or Facebook or leaving a comment on a page. Right. Um, opinion expression is important. I want to uh, highlight here as it is really um, uh, important in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, contributing uh, diversity in terms of perspectives on various issues. It is important because it, it matters whether or not we have citizens that are um, socially and uh, personally engaged and in participating in issues and candidates they care about. Um, and um, in doing so, uh, it can also be crucial to help moderate polarized opinions on certain issues. So informational engagement has to do with how uh, we use social media to share or seek information about political parties, candidates, or issues related to the election. And relational engagement is about using social media to connect with other uh, existing, uh, you know, uh, context that one already knows, or even uh, about how we use social media to connect with uh, new people that, uh, uh, you know, we come across in the context of election issues, uh, discussing, you know, um, uh, party candidates or even just uh, political parties. So this is really relational engagement is really about the development of and as well as maintenance of social capital, uh, you know, in the context of an election. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Now, because our intention was to understand the effects of changes from 2015 to, uh, to 2020, and the sampling ap approach as well as design were exactly the same in the 2020 as with 2015, we created a pool data set uh, where we match respondents using the same demographic quotas used to create the samples. These were age, gender, ethnicity, but in addition to that, we also uh, made use of household income as an additional quota to match respondents. Next slide. 
The next few slides detail all kinds of measures we use and their uh, reliability. We followed the same uh, categories uh, of um, generations that Carol uh, talked about from first line voters to other youth sandwich generation and boomers. Um, as Carol has already uh, ex actually explained quite a number of uh, these measures in the interest of time, I will not uh, um, elaborate each of them again, but just to say that the reliability of the measures were checked before we proceeded with the analysis. Uh, so uh, next slide. Right here, you can see the reliability of the composite uh, scores for each type of engagement. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Um, and uh, overall, uh, we can see the expressive engagement and informational engagement. Uh, they have both increased significantly in 2020. In particular, relational, um, uh, well, uh, I would say that while we can see that relational engagement, it remains high and the highest reported uh, types of engagement, uh, you know, uh, amongst respondents, uh, it, it is not statistically different uh, from 2015. What this also means, um, you know, in terms of, uh, if we look at this chart, what this also means is that people are reporting significantly higher frequencies of using social media to express opinions, as well as using social media to seek or share uh, information during this uh, 2020 election. Um, I think that doesn't come as a surprise, right? But now we can see that we have uh, data to show us what these different types of engagement looks like in 2020. Uh, in terms of generations, there was no generational difference for each of the three types of engagement. Next slide. Now, I was also interested uh, in looking at the factors that drive each type of engagement. So let's look at some of these factors first before understanding how their changes uh, impact each type of uh, engagement. Uh, so in our survey, we asked respondents to evaluate the trustworthiness of different platforms as a source of information during the election. So uh, they can be grouped as uh, broadly two types. Um, so these are the first type uh, are Singapore-based mass media, and the second type uh, are is what we call personal communications, which basically refer to instant um, messaging apps such as WhatsApp and Telegram. Uh, perceived trustworthiness of different platforms, for instance, may drive increased informational engagement since we may be more confident about sharing a video or article uh, that is you know, published from a trusted source. Uh, what we can observe from this, uh, the chart shown on this slide is that trust in mass media has in fact increased uh, you know, on the overall uh, in 2020. Uh, and regardless, but regardless of the year, uh, trust in mass media is actually um, higher than personal communications, right? If you look at both uh, 2015 and 2020, but it should also be highlighted, uh, as we can see here, that the increase in trust in com personal communications is in fact greater than the increase uh, in trust in mass media. So I really agree with Carol, you know, in, in one of her earlier points, uh, you know, as you, she was wrapping up her uh, uh, presentation, the next, perhaps the next question we should be asking in the, you know, next election is, is it going to be an IM election, uh, given that uh, we, we do see a, uh, you know, a significant, uh, proportionately greater gain in trust in IM as a source of information. Um, yeah, we can also, uh, next slide, please. Regardless of the year and platform, uh, younger reporters also reported, um, sorry, younger respondents also reported lower trust. Uh, what we can also observe from this uh, you know, set of findings on this slide is that uh, the trust, increasing trust was greater for older respondents on the overall basis, referring to those that comes under the sandwich generation group and boomers. Um, but yeah, generally, overall, on the overall sense, uh, we, we, we can observe that younger report, respondents uh, reported lower trust in um, uh, regardless of which year we are talking about and uh, regardless of, you know, um, uh, whether we are talking about IM, right, uh, personal communications or SG uh, uh, mass media. Next slide. 
overall, uh, political knowledge uh, has actually de decreased in uh, 2020. But this chart on uh, the chart on this slide uh, shows that this decline may have been driven by uh, generational differences. As you can see, uh, pol political knowledge has, in fact, uh, you know, generally decreased for older respondents. Uh, as you can see, yeah, it, it, it applies for both uh, in the sandwich generation and uh, boomers, uh, but um, uh, it has in fact increased uh, for younger voters. Next slide. We also ask uh, respondents to share the frequency of discussing the election with people around them. Uh, so uh, this can be their friends, family members, and uh, colleagues. So generally, this has decreased. But remember, the expressive engagement, as I shared earlier, has uh, in fact increased. Uh, collectively, I think this what this implies is that the way by which we engage in discussions with others about politics may be changing. Uh, perhaps it is not about, you know, meeting your family member, talking about politics or, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, party candidates over dinner, right, uh, or uh, something that you discuss with colleagues, uh, but um, it is much more expensive, quote unquote, right, uh, and something that we actually use social media to do. Next slide. Um, next, I'd like to discuss how changes in some of these factors matter in terms of the different types of engagement. Uh, in the interest of time and since relational engagement was not significantly different in 2020 compared to 2015, uh, I had actually uh, elaborated quite a bit, uh, you know, in uh, 2015 on relational engagement. Uh, in the next um, few minutes I have, I will elaborate more on the findings on both expressive and informational engagement. Next slide. Oh, sorry, stay on this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, so this is expressive. So uh, in terms of expressive engagement, the findings actually show that increases in uh, mass media uh, use as well as social media usage would also increase uh, expressive engagement for other use as well as those in the sandwich generation. Interestingly, uh, for boomers, only social media usage uh, increased in trust towards uh, personal communications, as well as increased political talk, frequency of political talk, uh, predicts an increase in uh, expressive engagement in 2020. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, what we can say about boomers here is that, uh, as we can see, uh, social media usage matters you know, in terms of um, uh, whether or not uh, they are more likely to uh, increase in their expressive engagement in 2020. Uh, but it's not just social media usage, but also in particular, uh, I am trust in, uh, in uh, personal communications. Uh, in particular, trust towards uh, Singapore mass media also matters for the youngest group of respondents we have, as well as those in the sandwich generation. But this is in fact a negative relationship. In other words, um, decreased trust in mass media actually predicts an increase in expressive engagement. Uh, what this means is that in moments when uh, younger respondents, especially in these groups, right, um, did not trust what was reported in mass media, they would turn to, uh, they're more likely to turn to social media to express their opinions. I think what is also interesting on this slide is the finding on knowledge. Uh, like the factor on uh, trust in Singapore-based uh, mass media, this is also a negative relationship. Uh, declines in political knowledge uh, implies an increase in expressive engagement for other youths as well as those in the sandwich generation. This has important implications, uh, I think, in the de development of our citizenry uh, in the coming years. There is a need to prioritize not just active citizenry, but also active and informed citizenry. Next slide. Sorry, next slide. Uh, are we on informational? Yeah, 
Okay. Uh, looking at the changes in informational engagement, remember this is about sharing and seeking information using social media. The main point I'd like to highlight here is how increased trust in personal communications, uh, in fact, positively predicts informational engagement for first time voters and those in the sandwich generation. So this implies that when pe people perceive their networks on instant messaging platforms to be reliable sources of information, their tendency to actively seek or share information uh, online increases as well. So uh, this finding, uh, in my opinion, highlight the importance of paying attention uh, to the overall quality and robustness of information that is shared across uh, different communication networks as well as different platforms. Next slide. So yeah, um, as I uh, mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, relational engagement, this was not uh, significant uh, in dif significantly different in 2020. So I will um, uh, go on to the final slide to elaborate my um, uh, on the uh, conclusions. Next slide. Um, yeah, was this an internet election? Uh, I remember. This question was probably posed uh, back in 2006, maybe, uh, when we started uh, thinking about how uh, the use of the internet may shape the way people uh, change uh, or the way people vote. Uh, in my uh, research, right, um, I look at this question a bit differently in the context of citizenship. Uh, so, um, my answer to this question is kind of yes, uh, because uh, the findings collectively uh, signal that social media was significant in shaping how Singaporeans engage with the election, especially in terms of expressive and informational behaviors. Uh, such engagement uh, is expected to become more pervasive and part of uh, the way we engage with social, civic, political issues in Singapore. Uh, and uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think it is important to uh, prioritize the development of active citizenship that is informed as well as inclusive. Um, and uh, it, yeah, in terms of uh, information and the quality of information that people are sharing and seeking, uh, it is important to address as a whole uh, and not just on particular um, media and platforms. So I think my time is up. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Um, again, uh, uh, sort of very fast ride through a lot of data. For me, what, what stood out was actually the use of uh, uh, informational use of uh, the internet, especially in the uh, background of fake news and POFMA. And there was a question, question here, which maybe some of you guys can tackle. Did fake news on uh, play a part in swaying people's voting considerations? And also, of course, trust and hesitance see and seeking information, information sharing as well. And the other thing which really jumped up at me is also the first time voters uh, even uh, had uh, really seemed to have shot up uh, in terms of political knowledge. So I think that that's really interesting and uh, uh, seems to be uh, catching up with the older generation and um, because of uh, social media. With that, I'll hand you over to uh, Associate Professor Chang Wei Yu, who will talk about swing voters uh, and how that uh, interacts with uh, each, uh, factors like gender, trust, uh, engagement, and interest in politics. Uh, Wei Yu? Um, thanks, uh, Tang Hao. So, uh, my slides, please. Um, well, uh, yeah, uh, I am Wei Yu from the Department of Communications and New Media at NUS. I also want to thank IPS and my dear colleagues there for involving me in this very important longitudinal uh, study. Uh, this presentation has received the generous help from Niao Yi Wing from uh, IPS as well. She helped with all the visuals and graphs in the presentation. I really want to thank her here. All right, so my presentation focused on this uh, concept called swing voters. Right? Um, next slide. Um, if you don't know what swing voters mean, uh, here is the definition. Swing voters refer to those voters who voted for one party in 2015 and changed to vote for another party in 2020, right? So if you look at this definition, uh, there are actually two kinds of uh, swing voters, right? The first kind would be the ones who swung from PAP, the ruling party, to the oppositions. 
And the second type will be the ones who swung from the opposition to PAP, uh, the ruling party. So uh, my analysis uh, is based on the same uh, online survey data set um, presented in the two uh, previous uh, uh, talks. So um, due to, uh, here uh, is the first caution I want to uh, make here. Due to uh, the high percentage of uh, refusals, 56% right? of uh, respondents refused to answer either the question on uh, uh, who they voted for in 2015 or the question on uh, 2020, right? So due to these refusals, we had relatively fewer uh, respondents uh, who uh, actually uh, can fall into the two categories of uh, swing voters. Uh, that's the first uh, caution I want to make here. Uh, second caution is um, these are all self-reported uh, measures, right? So that basically means uh, if the respondents uh, have decided to lie to us, uh, we have almost no means uh, to find out. Okay, next, please. Um, so um, here are the uh, questions I hope to answer in this uh, uh, presentation. Who were actually these uh, sw swing voters? Uh, what were their demographics, uh, uh, their media usage behavior, their political traits, voting reasons, so on and so forth. I also wanted to know what actually influenced their swing. Right. So here are some very quick answers uh, to these questions. So if you need to run, you can just take a screenshot of this uh, slide and you know the gist of my presentation. But I'm going to talk in details uh, in the rest of the presentation. Next, please. Uh, so the fundamental statistic here is uh, how many uh, swing voters actually change their mind. Right. Um, if you look at uh, the data in orange, right, that's 2020 data, 8% um, of uh, voters who actually uh, swung from PAP to the opposition, right? So that number uh, is very close to the actual figure. The actual figure is 8.7%, right? Uh, but this is in great contrast to 2015. Uh, in 2015, um, actually, um, it was 8% of voters who actually swung from the opposition to the PAP, okay? So um, I hope that uh, sets uh, the uh, foundation upon which we can uh, talk more about the swing voters. Next, please. Um, so this set of analysis uh, shows you how swing voters may uh, differ from non-swing voters in terms of uh, demographics. How uh, can you read the, this kind of graphs, right? Uh, you could always use uh, non-swing voters as a baseline, right? Um, how do they differ? You know, do, do, they, uh, do the swing voters uh, have older or younger age? You can always use non-swing voters as baseline. So uh, what we found in terms of age, uh, there were no significant differences. We also used the four generation uh, groups, um, first time voters, um, uh, the use uh, sandwich generation boomers right uh, in our analysis as well again no significant differences in terms of uh, the generation groups so uh, this funding uh, is consistent as in 2015 next please um, in terms of gender right uh, there were some interesting uh, findings um, so um, if you look at uh, um, 2020 this year 64% of those who swung from PAP to opposition uh, were males, right? And uh, that uh, number uh, is in great contrast to what we found uh, in 2015. In 2015, only 30% of uh, voters who swung from PAP to the opposition were males, right? So the gender distribution is basically reversed uh, this year in 2020. Uh, next, please. Um, ethnicity, right? So um, again, uh, no overall significant uh, differences in terms of ethnicity across uh, the three different uh, kinds of voters. Uh, however, it was not always the case, right? Uh, in 2015, we did find some significant differences. You, you look at the graphs. Uh, we in 2015, uh, we found that. Uh, you know, there were uh, a lower percentage of uh, Chinese voters and a higher percentage of Indian uh, voters who actually swam from the PAP to the opposition. Okay, that kind of uh, differences uh, didn't exist in 2020. 
Um, next, please. Uh, then we also examined uh, the housing types uh, across three different categories of voters. Again, no overall significances. Um, and again, uh, in, in 2015, we did find some uh, significant differences. In 2015, uh, if you look at uh, those who uh, live in HDB one to two rooms, uh, 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 there was a higher uh, so-called percentage of voters who came from this lowest ho housing type who actually swung from PAP to the opposition in 2015. Again, uh, that kind of difference didn't exist in 2020. All right, next, please. Um, the last the demographic variable we look at, look at was uh, education. No overall significant difference, again, were found uh, in education and that finding uh, is consistent uh, with 2015. Okay, so uh, down with demographics. Now let's look at uh, so-called political traits. Are these um, uh, swing voters uh, different from other voters in terms of their political interest, the efficacy, um, knowledge, engagement, uh, so on and so forth, right? So we examined a, a large number of such, of, uh, such kind of political traits. But there were only two uh, political traits which showed significant differences. So if you look at the graphs here, uh, it was uh, the opposition to PAP group, right, who actually showed the lowest level of interest um, in elections. Okay, um, and uh, the graph on your right hand side uh, showed uh, that uh, it was uh, the PAP to the opposition uh, group who um, had the highest percentage of voters uh, who signed a petition in the last six months. Okay, so these were the two, only two uh, significant differences we found in 2020. In 2015, by the way, there were no significant differences across all these measures. Okay, all right, next please. Um, all right, um, I guess many of you might be interested in knowing about this rally participation. Um, in 2015, remember rallies uh, were all held offline, right? Uh, this year, all rallies became online e-rallies, right? So um, here are uh, some of the uh, basic findings. Let's uh, start from uh, non-swing voters first. So uh, the first thing you can probably notice is regardless of whether it was uh, offline or on online rallies, um, the non-swing voters didn't show uh, uh, much difference when it comes to uh, their rally participation, right? So overall, they participated, 30% of, the, of them participated in uh, any rallies. Um, so that's um, uh, non-swing voters. Um, let's now attend to uh, the first swing uh, voter group, the PAP to opposition group. By just looking at, uh, you know, uh, the graph itself, uh, you can probably see that uh, the, 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 there is a quite different pattern um, in this uh, group. So um, first, uh, this particular group, PAP to opposition group, uh, in uh, general, overall, joined rallies the most. 46% of this group of voters joined any rallies. And if you look closer, at uh, you know which uh, parties uh, rallies they actually joined, right? So in 2020, they joined the opposition rallies the most, okay? Uh, and they joined the PAP rallies the least. This particular pattern seems to be the opposite in 2015. In 2015, uh, PAP to opposition swing voters actually joined the PAP rallies the most, okay? So that's an interesting contrast here. Um, uh, lastly, uh, let's look at uh, the opposition to PAP swing voter group, right? Uh, in general, this group of uh, swing voters uh, joined rallies the least, okay? Uh, only 20% of them ever joined any rallies, okay? Uh, next, uh, please. Um, now, um, let's move to uh, examining their media usage, including both mass media and uh, social media usage. Uh, no significant uh, difference again in terms of using mass media, right? Including uh, newspapers, uh, television, radio, uh, and the so-called uh, Singapore own, uh, online owning news and information websites, no differences, right? Uh, but we did find uh, some differences in terms of their trust in these uh, mass media, okay? So uh, the graphs here show you that uh, 
uh, the PAP to opposition swing voter group trusted print newspapers and reduce the least, right, compared to the other two groups. Okay, so you've probably wonder uh, how it looked like in 2015. In 2015, this group, the PAP to opposition swing voter group, actually trusted blogs and social networking sites more, right? But that kind of difference again uh, stopped existing in 2020. Okay, uh, now uh, next, please. Um, how about uh, internet and social media usage? No significant differences across the uh, three uh, types of voters uh, in terms of social media, all kinds of social media platforms and using social media for different purposes. Okay, next please. We also um, look at, uh, you know, interacting with political candidates uh, through all kinds of media. Again, no significant differences. All right, next please. Um, all right, um, voting reasons, right? Um, different uh, voters have different roles, uh, reasons to vote and to change their votes, right? So uh, this uh, set of analysis showed that the PAP to the opposition group were least concerned about quality of candidates, parties track record and management of COVID-19. Uh, uh, in contrast, they were most concerned about having different voices in the parliament. So that particular finding right, was consistent uh, in 2015. Um, uh, on top of that, we also ran a, a set of analysis to look at uh, satisfactions with different issues, as well as emotional responses to these issues. Right? So in general, the pattern uh, is uh, rather consistent. Uh, the PAP to the opposition swing voters were least satisfied, and they were also more uh, emotionally negative, uh, especially compared to the non-swing voters. Okay. All right, uh, next please. Uh, so the last uh, set of uh, um, analysis we have done uh, was basically a logistic regression uh, to predict the swing, right? And uh, the predictors we have used include uh, demographics, political traits, media use, voting reasons, everything we just mentioned, right? And uh, after the analysis, we found this. Uh, most uh, media and social media usage do not really matter. <laughs> there was only one exception. The exception was using the online versions of newspaper, radio, and TV, right? The more you use the online versions of these uh, so-called traditional media, the less likely the voter would actually uh, swing, okay? So that's uh, the only so-called media relevant significant pr predictor we found. Um, and what seems uh, to matter more is the voting reason themselves, right? Uh, especially the reason about uh, wanting to have alternative views in parliament. That uh, basically encourage uh, people to swing. All right, uh, next please. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, it's time for me to uh, conclude, right? Um, just uh, to wrap uh, what we have just um, shared, uh, the so-called PAP to the opposition group of swing voters in this year uh, were rather typical, right? So they tended to be males, uh, a complete uh, difference, right? Uh, if you compare to 2015, um, they signed a, a petition uh, more and they attended opposition's e-rallies, the most trusted newspaper and radio least wanted to have alternative views in parliament the most, right? So in conclusion, they were typical uh, because they were relatively more active in politics. They liked uh, to hear uh, alternative views in the parliament, right? Um, next, please. And then how about the second type of six swing voters who swung from, from the opposition to PAP in 2020? They were a bit unique. Okay, I say uh, they were a bit unique because we often have the expectation that swing voters change their votes because they want to achieve some kind of balance uh, in the political landscape here in the country, right? However, uh, this year, uh, the opposition to PAP group seem to be uh, least interested in the elections themselves, right? Then they uh, also attended the rallies uh, the, the least, right? Uh, they seem to be politically inactive and uninterested uh, in general. Okay, all right. Um, to uh, next, please uh, to uh, answer that big question uh, Carol asked 
uh, is this an internet election or not, right? Yeah, uh, my answer uh, has two parts. <laughs> the first part says, of course, yeah, everything uh, has gone uh, internet, the campaigning was fully on the internet. So it was an internet election in that sense. We also saw the gaps, right, that used to exist between the swing voters, right, and the non-swing voters um, seem to disappear. Uh, all kinds of voters seem to rely on social media at an equal level in 2020. Uh, the second part of my answer to that question is, and however, right, but, but if we look at the mass media usage, right, uh, there was also an equal level of using mass media among all kinds of voters, right? Um, and what is even more interesting is the regression right, results. What re actually influenced the swing? What actually influenced the swing seemed to be less uh, you know, about using social media, but more about the voting reason, right? Especially wanting to have alternative views in the parliament. Okay, so with that, uh, I want to uh, conclude and, uh, my presentation. Thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, Ryu, for that uh, fascinating uh, look at the swingers. Um, I find it particularly interesting that the, the, the women swung five years ago and the men uh, swung uh, this year. And uh, what were the uh, specific reasons? No, were there certain policies uh, or, or maybe candidates which uh, um, uh, led to that? Then uh, secondly, also the fact that uh, uh, whether you presumably from, from your results that whether you swing from one to the other, if you swung at all, the fact that you tend to consume the traditional media uh, or the online sites of traditional media. That means that people who uh, um, uh, didn't swing uh, were satisfied with the kind of content that they were getting, whether they are pro or or anti-PAP. Uh, 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 so with that, we will go on to our last but not least, uh, Chin Hong, who will talk about um, the media, social media use of political parties and uh, to what extent uh, they were effective or not. Uh, Chin Hong? Thanks, Diana, um, and thanks, um, IPS, for having me. Um, slides, please. Right, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Chin Hon. I'm the Chief Data Analyst with Analytics Labs, a local AI startup. Um, in my segment today, I'll be analyzing how four key political parties use Facebook during GE 2020 and the implications for future GEs. Um, before we get into the details, I'll just like to point out two things. Um, first, I'm only covering Facebook data. This presentation won't cover data from Twitter or chat apps due to time and resource constraints. Um, and second, Facebook interaction data is only a limited proxy for voter sentiment. There's no direct link between the data and how users ultimately voted, which is determined by a lot of other factors. Um, but what the interaction data from Facebook does suggest is that Singaporeans were sending a lot of interesting signals on Facebook before and during the GE, um, signals which I think were missed by the parties and many of us observing the election. Um, and it's this missed signals that I'll be focusing on during the presentation. Next slide. First, um, let me give an overview of what I'll cover today. Uh, my analysis uh, involves about 8,000 plus Facebook posts during the GE period. Um, and about 32,000 COVID-related Facebook posts from January 1st. I'll talk a little bit more about the data in a bit. Um, but even if you didn't, um, even if you weren't tracking a large number of posts during GE, um, it will be obvious to you that the various political parties pump a lot of content to Facebook in about the two plus weeks of broader campaigning. Um, however, the signs were that most of the parties only focus on distributing their content and messages on social media, um, you know, a fire and forget approach, if you will. There was no indication that they were analyzing in real time um, the impact of the content that they were generating directly or indirectly in the media. Um, so in a sense, the surprises in G 2020, be it Singkang or the swing towards the opposition, um, would have been far less surprising, in my view, if we and the political parties had paid more attention to the signals coming from um, Facebook data. 
And today we'll talk about four examples of these um, missed signals, uh, one which is COVID related, um, then I followed by Ivan Lim, um, the Sengkang race and the competing traction of the PAP and opposition's um, political messaging during GE. Next slide. Now, before we get into the charts, um, let me just take a moment to quickly explain the data sources and definition used uh, for the benefit of those who might not be familiar with social media metrics. The first data set that I use comprises over 8,000 G related Facebook posts in English and Chinese from 15 public pages between June 22nd and July 11th. Um, smaller subsets were then sliced from this main set using relevant keywords, uh, depending on the question that you're trying to answer. Um, the 15 FB pages are listed at the bottom of the slide. And you know, drawing the data from this bigger pool of Facebook pages beyond just the four political parties um, you know, gives us better context and richness for analysis. Um, I also use a set of over 32,000 COVID-related Facebook posts from the seven media outlets in Singapore um, in order to gauge the widespread GE assumption about a flight to safety effect. Now, this um, data is publicly available to anyone who has access to social media um, listening services like Social Bakers or um, Chartbeat. Um, the data here obviously does not include those from personal accounts. Um, and finally, a word on the uh, definition of the term that I'll be using a lot throughout this presentation, which is total Facebook interactions, right? Um, this simply refers to the sum of all nine possible ways of reacting to a Facebook post from shares, comments, um, likes to the six emotions um, that you can express on a post, um, such as love, angry, or sad. So a quick example, if a post has 10 shares, 10 likes, 10 comments, and 10 each of the six emotions, then its total interaction uh, would simply be 90. Next slide. Okay, um, now let's um, dive in, uh, into the data. Um, this first chart will help set the context for understanding how the key parties behave on Facebook before, during, and after the GE. So in this first chart here, um, you can see the number of posts per day by all four parties were mostly flat before um, GE was announced. Um, there was an average of about one Facebook post a day. Um, but the day after GE was announced, you, know, you see this massive spike in the number of posts by all four parties. On average, um, the parties were posting about eight times more during GE uh, than they were before the GE was announced. The PAP posted most frequently with an average of about 12 posts per day between June 23rd and July 8th. Um, at the peak, uh, the single day record is held by the SDP, which had 34 posts on July 8th, um, the, the final day of campaigning. Now, um, you know, GE 2020 is frankly the worst kept secret of the year. Um, yet the four main political parties, um, PAP, WP, SDP, and PSP, uh, weren't really active on Facebook in a big way before the election was announced on June 23rd. Um, and we know quite well by now that content dumping of this sort really runs the risk of turning off voters. So it's really strange to see the parties piling on um, in this way instead of engaging their audiences earlier or testing their campaign messages um, sooner. Um, next slide. Now, before we get into the examples of the four examples of the miss uh, signals that I talked about, I just wanted to quickly point out the dominant content format for GE 2020 from the parties. Um, and as you can see from this chart, uh, it's heavily dominated by videos. Uh, but due to time constraints, uh, I'm not going to go further into this. But if you have more questions on this, we can discuss this uh, later during the Q&A if you like. Uh, next slide. Now uh, we'll get into the first of the four examples of the signals on Facebook that the parties missed for GE 2020. Um, and this chart tries to examine that um, pre-GE assumption about COVID and the so-called flight to safety effect. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the biggest assumption going into GE 2020 is that there would be a flight to safety uh, effect among voters, so much so that the opposition parties in the early days of the campaign um, genuinely feared a wipeout. And from my conversations with some political watchers here, the anxiety among um, opposition parties um, it was pretty real, at least in the early days of the GE. Um, but Facebook interaction data would actually have raised serious questions about their assumption, especially if you examine how 
um, users have been interacting with the barrage of daily news stories on COVID. The, the chart here tracks total daily user interaction with COVID-19 related Facebook posts, again by the seven local media outlets here. Um, and it clearly shows how public interest in the issue has fallen sharply since peaking in April. Right, you see the two spikes um, when um, Circuit Breaker was announced and then when Circuit Breaker was extended. But if you look towards the right side of the chart, by the time nomination and polling days came around, uh, frankly, public interest in the issue, uh, at least on Facebook, had, had dipped to levels not seen since the beginning of the year. So to the extent that a uh, flight to safety instinct existed among voters, um, it had likely dissipated in a big way by the time the hustings were in full swing. Um, in other words, um, the electorate was significantly open to competing political messages, in my view. Next slide. Um, and frankly, you know, the Ivan Lim incident was really the first major sign that uh, voters here were paying attention to a bunch of other issues and that their concerns weren't as straightforward as um, some of us might have assumed. Um, and this is apparent in the chart here, which shows this massive gap between the level of public interest in the Ivan Lim controversy versus what the PAP had to say about its campaign manifesto. And through some strange coincidence, the controversy blew up on the same day that the PAP launched its election manifesto. Now, it's probably fair to say that, um, you know, people are always going to be drawn to online drama and controversy and that social media reaction for an election manifesto will always be low anyways. But, you know, when you have an interaction gap of this size, almost nine times between the, the two, um, you know, it should have rung some alarm bells for the PAP um, that its message on jobs wasn't registering with voters as well as they thought um, it might have or should have. Next slide. Um, my third example will take a broader look at this issue of how well the competing political messages resonated with voters throughout the campaign. Uh, the chart here compares user interaction of Facebook posts containing the PAP's um, GE messages uh, with Facebook posts containing the opposition's um, election messages. The 154 Facebook posts were filtered with 15 sets of keywords in English and Chinese for opposition-related posts and eight sets of keywords for PAP-related posts. So examples of the keywords used would be um, super majority, blank check, jobs, economy, and PMAT. Um, and again, the best way to read this chart is from the left to the right. So what you'll quickly see um, is how Facebook interaction with posts related to the PAP's jobs message peaked very early and pretty much lost team by the time the campaign added, ended. In contrast, um, Facebook interaction for the opposition's message peaked at the end of campaigning, just before cooling off day and polling day. Um, this notable enthusiasm gap uh, of about 5.5 times between the two um, could have given us a hint of the surprises to come on polling day. Um, and it's worth pointing out that the surge in FB interaction for the opposition's post on July 8 was largely driven by three heartfelt videos by current and former uh, Workers' Party chiefs, uh, Mr. Pritam Singh and Mr. Lao Kiang, respectively. In, in the short clips, the two opposition leaders thanked their supporters and made an emotive appeal for Singaporeans to make the vote count. Um, you know, in contrast, the PAP didn't really close their campaign on a particularly strong or memorable note. And Facebook interaction with posts mentioning the party's core messages decline you know, quite steadily after nomination day, as you would see in the chart. Um, and frankly, the interaction might have even been lower if not for PM's um, Fullerton rally on July the 6th, as you would notice at the bottom right hand, of, uh, bottom right -hand corner of the chart where you would see a slight uptick again uh, for PAP interaction. Um, in, for those of us who are familiar with US politics, right, um, the parties always strive to close their campaigns on an emotional high so that the supporters will feel that extra bit of motivation to go out and vote. Um, while Singapore politics is not stage managed to that extent, um, I think this is something that parties might have to consider more of going forward. Next slide. Um, and in my final example, um, we will look at Sengkang. Now, it's probably fair to say that uh, very few of us saw this one coming, right? Until the very end or close to the end of the campaign. But the signals on Facebook were actually quite clear uh, from the early stages of the GE. Um, the chart here is based on 325 Facebook posts between June 28th and July 11th, again by the seven media outlets in my sample that mentioned the contest in Sengkang. 
and the core members of the PAP and WP's team in that ward. Uh, the Facebook posts were filtered with nine sets of keywords in English and Chinese for WP Sengkang related posts and 12 sets of keywords for PAP Sengkang related posts. So examples of the keywords we include Sengkang, Jameis, and Chiming, and PAP in both English and Chinese. Um, you know, I, I won't go into the details of the events um, as mentioned in the chart, I, which I think, you know, all of you are very familiar with them. But if you look at the chart from left to right, you know, what's really clear is that the PAP team did not register much public interest on Facebook during the entire campaign period. So in this sample, the WP Sengkang team averaged 32,700 Facebook interactions per day throughout the campaign period whereas the PAP team uh, only managed an average of about 4,200 Facebook interactions daily. This is about a nearly eight times gap. And even PM Lee could not do much to help raise the PAP Sengkang team's uh, social media profile when he campaigned online with them on July 4th. Um, there's, there's, there's a big caveat to this chart, of course, which is that you know, those who re reacted to the Facebook post aren't necessarily all Sengkang voters um, or they might not even be Singaporeans. The reaction could have come from overseas uh, or people who have read the post overseas. Publicly available tools uh, simply don't allow you to break, uh, break down Facebook data by geographic region. Uh, so I just wanted to point this out first. Um, but you know, when you have a gap that's so big uh, between the two teams, there's just no doubt that the WP Sengkang team um, garnered far greater mind share and name recognition than their PAP rivals. And I think this is... Uh, a point that was also borne out um, in the media reports in the aftermath of um, G2020. Uh, next slide. So um, in conclusion, um, I think it's probably fair to say that political parties in Singapore are definitely getting at producing content for social media. You'll notice that the videos are getting more polished um, and the live streaming by them was generally pretty good. Um, but I think most of them are just still scratching the surface of what modern electoral campaigns in the US do um, in terms of data analysis and social media targeting. For the next G and beyond, um, they will have to think well beyond content creation and distribution. To do well, um, you know, they really need to better analyze the data generated by the media and their own activities and speeches when posted to social media. Um, to be fair, there are a lot of questions about the authenticity of social media data and we should indeed be skeptical. Social media data can be, manu can be manipulated, they can be misleading, um, but being skeptical is not the same as ignoring the signal from tens and sometimes um, hundreds of thousands of voters. Um, and I would say this is particularly uh, important in the Singapore context where the lack of regular polls and the passive media culture sort of really combine to create a very low signal environment for tho those of us you know, watching politics or those of us in politics. And that is why those who can accurately pick up the correct signal um, from the noise on social media uh, will have a huge competitive advantage at future polls. Next slide. Um, actually, this is the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, if you're interested in more background um, and GE related analysis from analytics, you can find them in the links here. Uh, the slides will be available to you soon. Um, I thank you for your time um, and I hand things back to Tan Hao. Thank you. Thank you, Chin Han, for that. Uh, again, very fascinating uh, 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 look at how social media uh, was used by the parties uh, and uh, the lessons to be learned. I'm not surprised after this, you get a call from one of the parties to be a consultant or, or more. Um, uh, well, I, one of the points that you made, which is very salient to me, is that uh, this is not a COVID-19 election, uh, according to your analysis, right? That it sort of petered out. And even the issue about jobs, which is consequence of largely of COVID, has also uh, the interaction, uh, which presumably is interest, uh, 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 has also petered out. And then second question about the tone deafness uh, of the messaging. Uh, uh, my, uh, my question is whether uh, these tools that you have uh, were uh, available to the parties at the time, the ongoing live tool, you know, of, of looking at... Uh, the, the signals in terms of interaction, or it's only you can only look at it historically. Um, so with that, uh, we go to the question and answer section of this um, uh, forum. And uh, let me kick off with uh, two uh, uh, sort of technical 
uh, questions about uh, methodology, which uh, 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 any one of you, uh, particularly Carol, I think. One is how was political knowledge measured? Uh, was it self-reported or was there a list of uh, a test uh, of political knowledge? And secondly, uh, when asking respond, uh, that comes from D, uh, Didi Amza. And second question from Gil Go, a familiar name. When asking respondents about perceived trustworthiness of mass media, was specific mass media outlets name or was mass media left open to interpretation? That means you say it is. And, and then were respondents polled on perceived trustworthiness of relatively newer platforms like Mothership vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Straits Times and uh, CNA. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe, I can... Maybe I can take the questions on knowledge. Okay. I was looking at it. Uh, so yep. it is not self-reported. Uh, it's a series of questions uh, in 20... I, yeah, in, in 2015, I think there were seven questions. In 2020, there were six questions. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a series of knowledge questions that people answer. And uh, it's based on the, uh, the, the knowledge score is called computed based on the number of right answers over the total number of questions. Yeah. And the, the, the Sorry, question please. on um, the trust in the uh, SG mass media, so it is not left to interpretation. Uh, the respondents, they were shown a list of uh, platforms, uh, Singapore-based uh, news TV stations and radio stations, as well as their websites and social media uh, pages. So it is about, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, what we would consider uh, sometimes called main mainstream media. Right, so it will be SBH, uh, CNA, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Um, if I could just add on, I think those are two. Uh, yes, methodological questions, but important. And you know, um, every uh, we are aware that every research methodology has its limitations. So whatever we do, as certainly with this survey, we try to minimize right and be as clear as possible. So like what Natalie said, yes, it's not self-reported as opposed to asking people to um, say and self-report how politically knowledgeable are you, you know, on a scale of say one to five, we literally came up with um, seven knowledge questions, um, a, a mix of uh, questions pertaining to uh, key policies like um, CPM, GST, to questions on specific candidates and parties that were contesting in this year's election. So from there, we did the scoring. And yes, we were very specific in terms of asking people for their perceived trustworthiness of different platforms. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, on the role of uh, instant messaging from uh, Walter Fernandez, a very senior person in MediaCorp. Uh, so his question is, is picking up on the hypothesis that uh, instant messaging like WhatsApp is gaining importance. Do you have a sense of what content is actually being shared via instant messaging? Is it content from the digital platforms of the mass of SG mass media uh, or digital only info sources? Was it or was it factual content and opinion that was created by individuals, friends, family in their IM circles? Right. Um, uh, and uh, 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 just, just to round out the question, and how would you weigh the relative importance between the source of the content being shared versus the platform through which it's being shared? Mm. Um, I will take a step at that. Uh, will you, Natalie, um, feel free to jump in, or Chin Hon as well? So, um, yeah, the, the weeks leading to polling day and certainly the days leading to 10 July were extremely exciting. Uh, the few of us, our, uh, we, we were completely inundated right, with all messages we were sharing on WhatsApp. So to answer Walter's first question, um, the type of content, uh, clearly there was a huge mix. Um, we, we, we saw the sharing of news articles, um, lots of screenshots, but more importantly, more importantly, what stood out for this election was the sharing of um, a lot of organically produced kind of content. So lots of memes, right? So much memes, um, uh, lots of links to petitions as well. So um, a lot of the content were very citizen generated and created. Um, and oftentimes they were links to um, different social media platforms. So uh, for that, that's the content part of it. But for the um, survey part of it, we mainly focus on the platform. Um, so we didn't look at the, we didn't actually ask people questions uh, on their uh, perceptions or reactions to the content. 
Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Maybe I'll just add on, uh, just on a methodological note, uh, you know, perhaps this is something we have to work on immediately after this. Uh, just methodologically, uh, instant messaging platforms, they are also very uh, challenging to uh, study, right? We may ask what is the effect of I am, uh, what is the effect of content times I am, right? Uh, the, the, the effect of a content appearing on instant messaging platform versus Facebook. What is the effect, right? Um, but instant messaging platforms methodologically, it's uh, uh, quite challenging to uh, study also because, um, yeah, I mean, the very nature of uh, private or semi-private uh, instant messaging networks uh, means that uh, Ethically, we are um, uh, not really allowed to go into, uh, you know, really um, loiter or stay in these uh, networks to look at the content that people are sharing. But we do know that, like what Carol said, uh, there was actually quite a number of, I think, uh, for created, uh, I mean, content that was created, obviously, for uh meant to be forwarded on instant messaging uh, networks. Uh, content, uh, videos that were, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, those morning greetings uh, videos uh, in that created in that style uh, meant to be forwarded uh, as well as, um, yeah, I mean, uh, just very, I guess, viral messages about um, particular candidates, right? So uh, we, we know, because we, some of us received them uh, and we know that this was some of the kinds of um, uh, content that was uh, forwarded, yeah. Um, were you uh, and uh, Jin Han? Did Maybe, you have any uh, From my uh, analysis, I can uh, say, the only thing I can share is there wasn't any differences in terms of uh, instant messaging uh, usage uh, uh, when you compare the three different groups of voters. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, at least uh, it wasn't a factor that uh, influenced their swing. Right? Um, uh, and another thing I want to add is we actually indeed had a few more measures on uh, uh, I am usage. Right? Natalie, uh, remember we actually asked about how uh, much of uh, the information you received uh, uh, yeah. from IM platforms turned out to be fake, right? Yeah. As well as how many of these groups later on actually uh, turned from, you know, an ordinary social neighborhood kind of uh, group to a political one. So, uh, you know, if uh, people are really interested in this, we can do more analysis and share uh, more about our findings uh, with the public in the future. Um, just very quickly from a data perspective, um, IM presents a very high um, technical bar uh, that you have to clear if you really want to analyze it well, simply because um, the data is not available, right? Or that the companies will not willingly share it simply because the whole attraction of the IM services like WhatsApp and Telegram are precisely because of the privacy issue, right? Uh, you are sharing on WhatsApp or Telegram because you don't want other people to see what you're actually sharing, say compared to Facebook or Twitter. So to then force the company somehow to give you that data, um, I think that's just gonna break their business model and I think they're gonna fight you tooth and nail um, on, on that issue. So I think being able to get good reliable data on, on IM is gonna be super tough, but Things are moving fast. I'm not sure what sort of agreements can be made in future, but without the tech companies behind these services sort of coming to an agreement uh, in terms of public service, in terms of what they were prepared to release, uh, I think it's going to be pretty tough. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question from uh, Pang Chun Han. Uh, uh, seems to be directed at you, Chin Hong, which is that previously large turnouts at rallies did not translate to votes. Uh, why do you think, why do we think that the online interactions may translate to votes or indication of the swing towards uh, uh, WP? Uh, yeah, so actually, where you can answer that. Where you, your answer is actually it does not translate, it does not change people's mind, right? But so, Chin Hon and where you? Chin Hon first, maybe? Sure. Well, um, here's the thing. Um, as I stated in the outset, right, um, you know, Facebook interaction data is actually very noisy. It, it does not connect directly to uh, actual voting behavior, 
right? So you can only make inferences um, about it. Um, and I think it will be very tricky um, to try to say because um, a lot of interaction happened here. Um, therefore, people are likely to vote um, one way or the other, right? So when you do this sort of post-election results analysis, certain things are clearer, but when you are in the um, thick of things, right? Um, you know, it, I don't think anyone's going to be very confident in coming out to say, um, you know, because your interaction data is that much, it's going to result in um, this sort of voting result. So a lot of um, so-called uh, the art of, um, you know, political analysis is, is still needed in terms of how you would interpret uh, that data and how you would interpret that sentiment. So uh, in short, I would say um, social media data or Facebook data is just one piece of the very complex puzzle um, that political parties need to look at uh, when it comes to elections and it's by no means the only one. Hey, you, you want to, uh, you have comments on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, to, to add on uh, what Ching Hong has said, right? Um, for, uh, if I look at my data, uh, those who swung from PAP to opposition, they did attend e-rallies more, right? And they, they were the ones uh, who had uh, the highest percentage of attendance uh, to the opposition's rallies, right? So that was one piece of evidence uh, saying that maybe a, a participating in e-rallies was some kind of uh, indicator, right, of their vote, but uh, it's not a 100% uh, translation. Doesn't mean that if you go to uh, opposition's uh, e-rally means that you are going to vote for them, right? Uh, second uh, piece of evidence I can share is um, we also included rally participation as one of our predictors, right? Uh, for the swing, right? Again, uh, wasn't a significant predictor, right? So uh, basic means, yes, maybe uh, those who swung did go to the opposition uh, rallies more, but that wasn't important enough, right? To determine their swing, right? All right. Um, yeah, that, well, we have uh, uh, 10 minutes left. Um, there's a question which, uh, uh, series of questions on the effect of uh, fake news and of mark. On, uh, on media, first of all. And of course, uh, then the big question is on, uh, on uh, how people voted and perceived the parties. Uh, what is your, I did two questions on that. I won't read, read them out. Uh, what's the role that this played and what's the role of uh, uh, OFMA uh, in this, uh, as far as media is concerned and then voting behavior? Um, who wants to say that? I think I, any one of you can answer that. Uh, I'll, I'll give us that. Yeah. So if I look at um, the survey, we did ask a question, if you recall, and it, I presented it in one of my slides, right? It is one of the, um, uh, I, I think, 11 issues, um, which we ask people uh, to indicate how satisfied um, they were with how the government handled the issues, right? So we did not ask POFMA, okay? The issue that we posed to them was similar to how we phrase the other issues like transportation, healthcare, population growth, cost, cost of living. So we gave them the option of um, deliberate online falsehoods. So how the government managed deliberate online falsehoods obviously would not uh, comprise mainly of POFMA, but perhaps other measures such as um, digital literacy, information literacy, etc. But that said, okay, we conducted the survey after polling day. Right. And we do remember that POFMA was used a couple of times during the election campaign. So there could be a possibility because of availability bias, you know, the heuristic, people could have been thinking about POFMA when they answered that question. Okay, so, um, so, so what do we see, right? If we look at the frequency breakdown in terms of people's responses, actually it's a relatively split response among the public. So the huge chunk, 40% of our respondents were ambivalent, okay? They selected the option neither agree nor disagree that the government, you know, did a good job handling deliberate online falsehoods. So we had 30% who strongly agree and, strong, uh, and agreed that, you know, they were satisfied with the government, while um, the other 30% said that 
um, disagreed and strongly disagreed with um, the statement, right? So, so that's clearly split. And then if you look at the regression analysis that we presented, um, yes, uh, how the government handled um, deliberate online falsehood did come out as a predictor of how people voted for the PAP and the opposition, but um, it was a small uh, effect. It had a small effect compared to people's primary reasons for voting. So I would say that, um, to, I mean, people's response, the public's response um, is really quite split uh, and there is um, a little bit of effect on how they voted. Okay. Anybody else wants to go at that? There, there didn't seem to be a lot of uh, sort of fake news going around, right? My, my impression, my limited boomers uh, circle. <laughs> no, I think um, whatever contentious information, uh, the government acted quite quickly during the election campaigning time. Yeah, and, and, and both sides uh, had, had their say. Yeah, well, um, uh, this question about, you know, the role of uh, authenticity and authenticity and uh, privilege, you know, these, these two issues which are uh, uh, particularly salient, I uh, want to presume among the younger voters, right? With all this wokeness and, 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 uh, and there was also, um, uh, 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 was it a big issue? And especially since it's such a mediated uh, um, uh, election where you have no chance to see or hear the uh, candidates face to face, um, uh, especially the opposition ones, and uh, so what was that issue? And what was was how, in a way, uh, Singkang lost because of uh, the right Rayash uh, gaining that that um, uh, 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 putting uh, putting paid to this idea of uh, you know people privilege and questioning me, and also authentic and James, you know, appearing very very authentic. And also at the beginning, the PAP, there's a, Martin C had this uh, vi uh, video, I think, I, I don't know, I think it's a post of video, where he said that everybody's claiming, every PAP candidate is claiming to be from poor families, right? Uh, and as a way to be authentic. Uh, was that a big issue, uh, uh, for, especially for younger voters? Actually, um, I think I will comment on the authenticity, not so much uh, from in the context of uh, candidates presenting themselves, uh, but during the um, election, um, there was a number of pages that were taken down uh, due to what Facebook described as inauthentic um, coordinated behavior. So I, I think this alludes to the earlier point as well on the um, uh, deliberate online falsehoods, right? Uh, so the question is, right, um, in, if we really think about DOF, like on, online fal falsehoods, what does it mean for the uh, Singaporean voter? What this means is, can I trust uh, what I receive or, you know, on my uh, WhatsApp group, uh, you know, about this um, uh, going viral news about... Um, you know, a candidate, can I trust uh, what uh, I read online, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, regardless of what platform uh, I, I actually, how I access this article. I think it is about trust. Uh, so I think, um, uh, so I, I, I think it is, uh, yeah, I agree with Carol, it's important to think about um, uh, deliver online falsehoods as an issue that has to be, uh, I guess, tackled, not just you know, in, in the context of POFMA, but uh, also what is actually uh, the role of particular um, you know, plat tech platforms, right? <laughs> you know, in terms of taking down this you know, inauthentic uh, coordinated behaviors as and when it happens. So I, I think it matters, right? When these moments uh, came up and uh, it matters uh, for people as well, especially during a uh, time when we are having an election. Okay. This question for our you. The PAP's candidate selection process was severely criticized following candidates, candidate Ivan Lim saga. Do you think that the issue resulted in swing votes from the PAP to the opposition? And uh, how many percentage points that is worth? Uh, um, uh, and I, there's a related question, which is basically uh, uh, the people who did not swing tend to go for 
uh, uh, tend to uh, uh, be reliant on the sort of mainstream media, right? Do you have any uh, speculation on, on that? Uh, because you're not searching or whatever. Uh, the first uh, two questions were super hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw that qu those questions uh, on, on Facebook uh, live streaming. Um, uh, first, uh, you know, I have to be uh, very honest. We didn't really ask anything about Ivan Ling right? uh, in our survey. Right? Uh, so uh, there is no way for us to find out uh, whether uh, that particular incident uh, is a factor that influences, uh, you know, uh, uh, their, their swing, right? Uh, the, the, the only item that might be a little bit close to that was uh, quality of candidates. We did ask about quality of candidates. Do you care about this and how this influence you, right? So what we found, again, two pieces of evidence, right? The first one was uh, those who swam from um, uh, opposition to PAP said uh, they care about uh, quality of candidates a lot, right? Uh, however, when we put that particular item into the regression uh, to predict that swing, it wasn't significant, right? So uh, what can I say? Maybe uh, it's something that concerns that particular swing group uh, which swung from actually opposition to PAP, right? Uh, but uh, it's again, not important enough uh, to determine their swing. So uh, that's my, uh, I guess, answer to the first the two questions. Uh, that, that was, that's absolutely no way for me to figure out how many percentage of uh, swing voters swan uh, because of uh, Ivan Ling Asaga, right? Um, second question is about, uh, you know, uh, that, that's a very interesting question. I was also trying to think more about that. Um, you know, those who used online versions of uh, traditional media, right? Newspaper, TV, redo actually were less likely to swing, right? You know, uh, less likely to swing means both, both ways, right? If they used to vote for PAP, you know, uh, they, they continue voting for P PAP. If they used to vote for uh, WP, they continue voting for WP or other, yeah, WP, only WP, right? So, um, yeah, so they, that, that probably means that uh, you know, uh, they, if they seek out or use a lot of uh, the online versions of, of the traditional media, right? So to them, maybe uh, it's just a matter of changing platforms, right? So uh, they are still uh, probably equally uh, 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 acceptable or equally critical of what they read, right? From uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, tra so-called traditional mainstream media. But to them, it's just a matter of change changing platform, right? So uh, the, the content, uh, you know, they consume, the, the way they digest and, you know, interpret the content might be the same as before. That's why the more they use the online versions, uh, you know, the less likely they change their minds, right? So uh, that's my, really my speculation, right? <laughs> Thanks, Tang Ho, for, yeah. for the question, right? Thank you. Uh, we have uh, five minutes left, four minutes, uh, uh, and uh, if, you have any uh, last words? Uh, I mean, for me, for what, what is the biggest takeaway? What surprised you about uh, about uh, media in, election, in this election? You know, what's the thing which really jumped out of you? And when you went in, you did not expect. And and uh, uh, what does that mean? Quickly, in one minute. Uh, if if, if uh, uh, so, uh, I'll just go down the line from Chin Hon first, <laughs> in reverse order. Okay, sure. Um, well, not, not so much a, a surprise, but um, I, I would say that um, political parties here still seem pretty traditional, if I were to put it politely, uh, in, in, in the way they approach um, social media. Um, there seems to be greater willingness to trust face-to-face -face, um, interaction, rallies, and, and what have you, and the traditional um, legacy outlets and things like that. Um, nothing wrong with that, frankly. Um, and I think that um, some parties are probably trapped in a false choice of sorts, right? In trying to decide whether, you know, to just go with uh, what they're familiar with versus what's coming up on the social media data. And frankly, you don't need to choose between the two. It, to, in order to be competitive, it's really about using all um, available resources as well as you can in order to do well at the polls. And what I hope 
um, that they will do more of in future GEs is really bring a lot more of the modern um, data analytics tools and, and, and skill sets into um, the campaigning here. And I think that will reduce the number of surprises that pop up uh, from GE to GE. Yeah. Okay. So, Chin Huan's message, modernize our parties. Uh, will you? Maybe I take the opportunity to answer another question I see uh, from the comments. Okay. Uh, you yeah. know, there was, there was a question about, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I said uh, there were two parts of my, my answer to the question of internet e election, right? And there was a, a, a user who pointed out that, uh, you know, uh, isn't that the case that, uh, you know, uh, the internet or the consumption of online uh, content that made uh, the voters want more so-called alternative voices uh, in the parliament. Uh, could that be, you know, a connection between using the internet and, uh, you know, having this kind of uh, voting reason uh, on the top of their list, right? So that's a, that's a great question. I, I tried uh, to, to think about that. Um, you know, one thing I want to uh, say is uh, wanting to have alternative voices in the parliament has been one of the top reasons, right? for a long time, regardless of how prominent the internet was uh, in the election campaigns. Right? But there's, uh, I don't want to rule out the possibility that uh, uh, consuming online content, right? especially uh, the so-called alternative media content, would change people's uh, view on how much alternative view, uh, uh, voices have been represented in the parliament. Right? This, these two factors uh, don't have to be like isolated from each other. They could, you know, feed into each other, uh, especially in the long run. Right? So yeah, that's that's my answer, and that's also my last comment. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So certainly, alternative credible voices, right? You don't want alternative voices which are not credible, and maybe the internet allows you to judge the credibility, or at least. Uh, 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 mediated credibility of the, and maybe that's what happened with James Lim, that nobody knew about him, and then this, uh, uh, he comes forward and, you know, he's, he's gained so much credibility and could be a good alternative. Uh, um, uh, Natalie? Uh, thanks, Nahao. Um, I think for me, uh, not so much surprising, but encouraging uh, has been uh, the findings on expressive engagement. Uh, for close to a decade now, I've been asking these questions, uh, at some point, I thought I maybe I should give up asking these questions because the 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 response is always quite low, right? The frequency is quite low. Uh, but the fact that I I see in this internet that uh, it has increased and uh, it also uh, the findings also show that it is not just something that younger voters do and engage in. Uh, that to me is encouraging because um, I I feel that um, uh, the more we encourage students, citizens, right? Um, I have many students, so I say students. <laughs> but yeah, the more we encourage citizens and if citizens actually, uh, you know, uh, feel uh, empowered enough, uh, they, they, uh, they feel like they have something to say, they should, right? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, I think this is important, especially with issues that are potentially polarizing. Um, but what I do want to, uh, I guess, um, uh, encourage everyone to think about is also how everyone can do engage in these expressive forms of engagement in a very um, informed and uh, civil way as well. So I think uh, you know the 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 threat of uh, you know people being in very isolated uh, circles um, is is real, especially with issues that are polarizing. Um, and uh, yeah, this is something we have to. Think about also in terms of uh, what platforms, uh, you know, and recommender uh, systems and algorithms actually show us. So, yeah, that that's my one minute <laughs> takeaway. Yeah, people are finally uh, using it to say what they feel. Okay, um, Carol. Okay, um, just a quick one before I say before I name my surprise, I just want to echo what Natalie said. I think this um, GE, most of us who were studying the election really felt quite heartened by the kind of um, engagement we saw you know, on Instagram. When Instagram became popular, we all thought that, oh yeah, I, mean, I was just sharing of like food, fashion, pictures, etc. But we, could, we saw during this GE how it was used by, I think, young people 
a lot of whom could be young voters, you know, to, to educate one another and to mobilize one another to be more interested in the election. I think this is this is great. You know, this 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 votes very well, right, for um, for the electorate. So my surprise, my surprise actually, um, you know, Tan in 2015, after the election, you wrote a piece uh, on WhatsApp, right? And um, and and we see from the findings today, you know, how WhatsApp um, is really breaking new ground. Really, I think um, in the next five years, I really do expect to see how part, um, to see parties and candidates leverage instant magic messaging more effectively, not just during election time. Okay, that is not good enough. But in on in the normal on the normal days in the years and months leading up to the election, how to keep at that game. You know, and um, you know, you talked about it in 2015. So it's also a surprise that you know parties somehow did not kind of pick it up. You know, um, and uh, right now we're seeing some attempts by some parties, and I think that's good. I think perhaps um, in Singapore, the dominant WhatsApp messaging, uh, instant messaging platforms that are used are instant message uh, WhatsApp, and now Telegram is gaining ground, right? And obviously, Telegram with its features and its latest features will accord more interactivity and opportunities for engagement. Uh, but many years ago, we already see how parties in other countries like South Korea, you know, leveraging I am like line and Kakao talk quite effectively to build relationship with their voters. So I think that is definitely something we need to keep a very close watch on. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all four panelists. I learned so much. Um, um, yes, a revelation for me, uh, the findings. Uh, and thank you, the audience, for staying with us. Uh, uh, and uh, there's no such thing as free lunch. Please fill up our online feedback form. Uh, is on the comments uh, section. There's a link there. Uh, and then I also uh, am uh, going to give a shout out to the next forum, the third in the series. Uh, and this time we have it right from the horse's mouth. The parties will come and talk about their vision and plans for after. Uh, the election. So please tune in. Oh, and the date is 2nd, 22nd October, 4pm 4, uh, 4 as well. So you'll be live, stream live on Facebook, and we hope to see you there. Thank you for staying with us. Goodbye, and have a good day. <laughs>